Christ the Savior Cathedral in central Moscow, a symbol of the city, an imposing building for 10,000 believers, which had been built to commemorate the fire of Moscow and the defeat over Napoleon. Old Russia was destroyed in the 1930s, but what replaced it was built on a shaky foundation. This is where the Palace of the Soviets was to be built. A symbol of Soviet power, it was to be the largest building on the planet. Plans call for its spire to be crowned with a statue of Lenin. But this was scrapped because of the soggy ground surrounding the building. In the mountains of Pamir, climbers scaled the highest peak in the Soviet Union. Their packs contain a heavy burden, a stone figure of Stalin. The summit is renamed Mount Stalin, and it's 360 meters taller than Mount Lenin. This incident is symbolic of Stalin's policies in the mid-1930s, whereas 10 years earlier, memories of Lenin had still been fresh. Modern animation was to promote the party. This campaign was Stalin's idea. The party is to be renewed in the name of the dead Lenin. The message is supposed to be, Lenin is dead, but Leninism lives. The only thing missing is a strong leader who is as widely recognized and respected as Lenin. More than 300,000 new members rush to join the party. Stalin slyly co-ops the national feeling of solidarity brought forth by Lenin's death. Entire collectives join. Stalin's apparatus creates its own party. The new members are politically inexperienced, who only have a vague notion of what Marxism is. They become the base for Stalin's power structure. The young Soviet state starts to produce its first successes. Three-fourths of the Tsar's subjects were illiterate. The five-year plans for culture and education produce impressive statistics. Russian satirists, however, mocked many of the newly literate, claiming that the best they could do was scribble their names. The German communist Clara Zetkin, she was a pioneer in the struggle to liberate Soviet women. Eastern women put away their scarves and joined in the construction of Soviet society. They won political equal rights. Progress was reflected in their election to the top levels of the party. Was there nothing positive under socialism? I think there were some positive phenomena. For example, the fight for equality between the sexes. Of course, this was not realized in the initial forms of socialism, but there was the struggle to get all levels of society involved in helping lead the country. And not only those with access to money. Those are positive aspects of socialism. I also think that Marxism contains some positive elements regarding how the state should care for the less fortunate in society. But these were completely misrepresented under Stalinist socialism. Stalin showed how the idea of creating a better world can be abused. Why? The main reason why Stalin, Stalinism, and also, of course, Leninism were historical disasters is because they trampled on freedom. May 1924, the 13th Party Congress begins, the first one without Lenin. Stalin is confident of victory. Everything is ready to strike a fatal political blow to his main rival, Leon Trotsky. But then Lenin's final testament unexpectedly surfaces. This describes Stalin as vulgar and unqualified for his position. Stalin offers to resign, but this is rejected by the delegates who reason a Stalin loyal to Lenin is better than Trotsky, who was seen as vain and confrontational. <laughs> 
With the outcome, Trotsky's fate was sealed. Grigory Zinoviev was the powerful party secretary of Leningrad who became one of Stalin's figureheads. Politically finishing off Trotsky alone would have been too much for Stalin. Zinoviev and Kamenev were rhetorically brilliant and with Stalin created a troika. This three-man group now ran the country. They were given cover by Bukharin, one of the most popular leaders of the Communist Party. New delegates were carefully chosen from the ranks of Stalin's supporters. They were not to be partial to political debate, but rather were to carry Bolshevik ideas to the countryside. They were trained to operate film projectors. Taking our face to the villages was the party congress's solution for winning the support of a skeptical peasantry. As early as 1922, Lenin told Stalin how important film and radio would be for propagating communism. Lenin wrote to Stalin, Developing radio is a necessity for our propaganda and agitation, especially for those among the masses who can neither read nor write. Lenin saw the electrification of Russia as essential. Electric lamps were soon to light up the cities. Lenin said, socialism and electrification will help us create communism. Electrification would transform Russia into a modern industrial state. The power station became the symbol of progress. The poet Gerasimov wrote, Beneath the voltage bows glows the happy village. Beneath this milky way sings a children's choir. The heart of the peasant is an electric light bulb. The country's vast natural wealth was the basis for the Bolsheviks' gigantic experiment of industrialization with capitalism. This natural wealth was to generate the money which the Soviet state so desperately needed. Money to buy machines and arms for rebuilding industry after the wars and for modernizing facilities which survived the Tsarist era. Wood was another vital source of revenue. Starting in 1922, exports of lumber quadrupled in four years. A settlement on the Lena, on the edge of Siberia. Adventurers came here to try their luck. The Soviet state owns unbelievably large gold reserves which were first exploited under the Tsars, which even today still generate some capital. Moscow in the 1920s, the party decides to give the country a breathing spell. Lenin once said, in order to go forward, it is sometimes necessary to go back. Private enterprise such as trading, crafts, and small industry were once again legal. The worthless paper ruble, which neither the workers nor peasants no longer want to work for, is discontinued. The new economic policy, or NEP, also gives the peasants a respite. Some communists see the NEP as a first sign of Bolshevik decline. Stalin justifies the change of course by saying, we want to clear a path for the rebirth of the country and to secure the union of workers and peasants regardless of the obstacles. Soya Fyodorovna remembers the so-called Soviet Golden Age as a time when people were just a little better off than previously. I was a young girl in Moscow when the new economic policy began and started to earn my own money. Other people did the same and began to realize there was another way to live. 
It seemed as if overnight shops were being transformed into halls in which the windows displayed food, clothing and shoes. It was beautiful to experience. Ordinary people especially enjoyed it. Certainly, before the revolution, there had been a class of women who had jewels and furs, but now everyone began to live more freely, more satisfied, better groomed, and in a more beautiful way. That's exactly how it was. With my first paycheck, I was able to finally buy a skirt and blouse. That's how it was. December 1925, the 14th Party Congress, hopes of world revolution have faded. Socialism was now threatening to die on the vine, as Stalin put it, or would it simply find a new perspective? Stalin put forward his theory of socialism in one country. He said the poor Soviet Union could build socialism without the help of the outside world. There were many at the Party Congress who opposed this path, but Stalin succeeded in keeping any serious opposition at bay. The founder of the Cheka secret police, Felix Zerzhinsky, also defended Stalin's economic policies. He died after giving one especially emotional speech. His death unified the old Bolshevik elite for the last time. Stalin regarded Zerzhinsky as an upstanding Bolshevik, as did Trotsky. Stalin, Trotsky, Kamenev, Bukharin, Koibyshev, Zinoviev, Rikov, Kalinin, Boroshikov all carried the coffin of their dead comrade. December 1927, the 15th Party Congress draws a line to the opposition being put forward by Trotsky and Zinoviev. Both were expelled from the party, as were 75 other prominent Bolsheviks, including Kamenev, Radek, and Piatikov. Stalin formed a new troika. He was now supported by the party's economists, Rykov and Bukharin, who backed his efforts to rid the party of so-called leftish deviants. At this point in time, Stalin favored a moderate pace of industrialization and felt that violence was inappropriate to speed it up. He also felt that the villages should be allowed to develop peacefully. Collectives were allowed to develop slowly and voluntarily on a step-by-step -step basis. This was the party's policy, their intention to move the countryside from an agrarian backwater to a modern industrial state led to the first five-year plan. The main focus of the five-year plan was to develop heavy industry, especially steel production. This would require vast amounts of energy. The center of Soviet mining in the 1920s gave the Kremlin no cause for optimism regarding the country's economic policies. Coal was extracted using mostly outdated methods. Production barely met the demands of industry. The country mined only 3% of the world's coal, a dismal situation given the vast size of the Soviet state. The drilling towers of Ukta, northern Russia, the search was on across the Soviet Union for the energy of the future, which was oil. The Russians called it black gold. Those who found oil reacted in the same happy manner as did those who previously struck gold. The party demanded that the oil industry be developed faster than other industries. At times it seemed as if nature was listening. From 800 meters inside the earth, oil shot out of the ground so forcefully that it split the wooden drilling towers. From that time on, there was no concerns about the environment in the Soviet Union.
In the 20s, small-scale production formed the backbone of Soviet industry, around 80 percent, especially in the villages which were unable to survive without the daily necessities provided by local craftsmen. But Stalin also saw industrialization as part of the battle against the small business class. By eliminating this class, Stalin also hoped to eliminate the bourgeois from Soviet territory. Agricultural production also declined because of a shortage of tools and equipment. December 21, 1929, the entire Soviet Union celebrates the birthday of the great leader, as Joseph Stalin is now referred to. Top Bolshevik functionaries compete in their efforts to flatter him. They try to outdo each other in their attempts to praise Stalin. Now it's Stalin, the Lenin of our time. It is maintained that Stalin led the Bolsheviks to victory in the October Revolution. Everywhere it can be heard that Stalin is the father of the party and the Soviet state. It was the birth of a cult of personality. A few weeks later, the battle in the villages began. The peasants are ordered to form collectives. For years, the agitators in the party have promised machinery and other wares. In exchange, the countryside is to produce grain for the city and for export. But the peasants remain skeptical. Only around four of every 100 farms agrees to join a collective. Even these remain too small and can barely feed the peasants' own family. Stalin justifies collectivization by saying that most farms are too small to even raise chickens. The state is only able to convince some of the peasants to join collective farms. The rest are pressured by force. Urban activists order the peasants to join the collectives with no excuses. The old Russian village with its individual lamb parcels is extinguished. The peasants resist. Grain deliveries drop by two million tons. The city suffer even more than previously. Stalin takes direct action by sending workers, functionaries, and policemen to the countryside to take the grain from the peasants. Stalin wants the grain crisis to be resolved using force. The party blames the suffering on the wealthier peasants known as kulaks, which the party claims are trying to exploit the other peasants. A war of destruction is declared against the kulaks. This affects the most capable elements of the peasant class and is aimed at those who have and are able to produce slightly more than the others. But the state does not only confiscate from the larger landowners, but also from millions of small landowners who first attained land through the revolution. Twelve-year-old Pavlik Morozov denounces his own father, who allegedly had helped the Kulaks. The father is sentenced, while Pavlik is celebrated as a hero. Two years later, he is killed by the peasants of his village. Dekulakization is the word which dominates the countryside. Hundreds of thousands of peasants are sent to Siberia under the watchful eyes of the military and the secret police, now known as the OGPU. The functionaries mock them with cries of, off to Siberia to watch after the polar bears. The Stalinist apparatus of terror emerges during collectivization and is always seeking new victims among the peasantry. The liquidation of the kulaks becomes a war against the villages which make up four-fifths of the population. The peasants desperately try to defend themselves. There are revolts. Barns and stalls on the collectives come under siege. Half of all the horses and cattle are slaughtered. Hardly any animals are left for plowing. There is no meat for the cities. Peasants burn barns containing grain stocks. The peasants are declared to be enemies of the Soviet state. 
A collective activist was murdered in this village. Her funeral became a signal for violence against the so-called Kulaks. Banners read, We demand the deportation of Kulaks from our region. This revolution from above, as Stalin described collectivization, remains controversial until the present day. Yet, industrialization would have been impossible without such drastic changes. Yet Stalin's methods only further damage the country. Today, when asked the question, was there an alternative to reforming Soviet agriculture than the path taken by Stalin? The answer has to be yes, naturally. But we never had the experience enjoyed by much of the rest of the world of large farms or farming co-ops, which were set up on a voluntary basis and with at least partial support from the state. Stalin decided to force everyone into collectives and in doing so pushed Soviet farming back into the serfdom era of the 19th century. The collective was actually a 20th century version of serfdom. Stalin's collectivization called for the destruction of the most able, professional and hardest working elements of the peasantry. For decades, this damaged the very heart of the peasantry, which has yet to recover. Up until the present, we have had to buy wheat and other grains from Canada, the United States and other countries. This shows that agriculture never became self-supporting because Stalin replaced the peasantry with slavery. The results of collectivization were devastating. It took Soviet agriculture seven years to return to 1929 production levels. Stalin's revolution from above changed Russia more than did a thousand years of Tsarist policies. The battle against religion was also intensified. This was organized by the Union of the Fighting Godless led by a close associate of Stalin's. In 1935, the organization had more than five million atheist warriors. The state wanted to drive the church from the villages. The Bolsheviks reasoned it would be easier to force the peasantry into collectives if the economic, social, and cultural roots of the village were destroyed. Even the atheist movement had a five-year plan. Their stated goal was to eliminate God by 1937 and started doing so by destroying his houses of worship. Then the symbol of the new faith was raised. For its part, the church did not mince words. After the revolution, the Patriarch of Moscow said, socialism is the religion of pigs. The young intelligentsia was especially enthusiastic about the war on the church. They sang a popular song of the time. Out with the monks, the rabbis, the popes, in heaven we're cleaning out the barn stalls of God. Collectivization was followed by industrialization. The summer of 1930, young communists register all over the Soviet Union to help build the country. The first five-year plan must be made a reality. Magnitogorsk, or the Mountain of Magnets. People had mined iron ore here since the 18th century. A huge iron mining complex was to rise here out of nothing. The plan is ambitious. The iron ore deposits are some of the richest in the world. Coal for the new city is to be brought in from 2,500 kilometers to the east. Enthusiastic young people set out to fulfill the bold plan. They are joined by peasants displaced by collectivization. Two hundred thousand people will later live in a model socialist city. Railways and dams are built first, followed by housing. Plans for the steelworks come from America and include blast furnaces, smelters, and cupola furnaces. The first peasants have a hard time adjusting to the unfamiliar machinery and factory work. They are also prone to alcoholism. Signs warn against operating the machinery while drinking. Foreign engineers and specialists arrive to act as foremen, advisors, and managers. One of them is an American student. In 1933, he reported, A quarter million people, communists, kulaks, foreigners, Tatars, 
Saboteurs and masses of blue-eyed Russian peasants create the largest industrial complex for steel in Europe, right here in the middle of the inhospitable steppes of the Urals. Men freeze, starve, suffer, but the construction work proceeds without regard for the individual and a massive scale of heroism seldom seen in human history. The success of the project is celebrated as a socialist victory and is described as Stalin's miracle. The unusual mixture of enthusiasm and disregard for human life helped further Stalin's project of socialism in one country, but no one bothered to count the victims. Another bold aspect of the five-year plan was the electrification of the railroads. This was vital to establishing a network between the industrial centers of the far-flung country, which were often thousands of kilometers from each other. Use of electricity jumps. The Dnieper River was dammed. The results were rapid. The power plant generated more than half a million kilowatts of energy in 1939. Coal mines were modernized and expanded. Demand for coal doubled within the span of a few years. Modern methods were also used for extracting gold. The enormous income this generated helped finance industrialization. All these successes seduced Stalin into planning ever grander and unrealistic projects to be accomplished in ever shorter periods of time. The number of industrial accidents grew rapidly, basic needs were catastrophic, and foodstuffs were rationed. Managers protested in vain. They attempted in desperation to avoid directives from Moscow, but the party struck back. Economic experts, most of whom came from a bourgeois background, were branded as deviants and saboteurs. They were prosecuted in a series of public show trials. The most important of these cases was the trial in 1930 of the so-called Industry Party. State Prosecutor Vyshinsky filed the charges against eight high-level technical specialists and economic professors. The case before us concerns the counter-revolutionary organization from the Union of Engineers, the so-called Industry Party. Over the last two years, the unstinting work of OGPU intelligence agents has uncovered a series of deviant organizations in many industrial sectors. Deviant elements have been at work in industries concerned with transportation, arms, textiles, shipbuilding, chemicals, gold, oil, as well as other industries. Defendant Ramzin, you have heard the charges. Do you accept the charge of guilty? Yes, I admit my guilt. Pre-trial interrogations usually broke the will of those charged with such crimes. Torture, threats, and threats against family members were all part of the secret police's arsenal. Everyone admitted being guilty. Instead of defending themselves, they prosecuted themselves. The goal of the deviant work of the industry party, with the help of the French government and white 